So we're going to argue about open versus closed uh, ventilation. And um, closed ventilation is, of course, the safe bet. Take no risks. And the open lung ventilation, um, of course, involves recruiting chronically collapsed lungs. So what this is really about is what are the actual goals of ventilation? Of course, we want to have safe and min safe ventilation and minimise ventilator-induced lung injury, but we also want to do what is healthiest for the lung. Now, you're all familiar with this man from central Italy. He is uh, held in high esteem, but of course, he's got very dated ideals. And that is also true of my opponent. <laughs> and you see him here. He's come out with gowns and clothes and, uh, you know, a, an ominous looking cross there. But he is going to give you traditional and dated dogma. And he is going to be, like his predecessors in this role, rejecting of change and innovation and improvement. And this is what we need to do in today's uh, world. Now, we're all familiar with the uh, CT scans of ARDS. We know it's got three functionally distinct zones. We know the protective ventilation um, reduces the injury in the least dependent zones by stopping over distension with low plateaus and reduced uh, driving pressures. We know that PEEP stops the injury from the intermediate zone. But the basal zone is left um, unfixed. We know that the lung can produce injurious cytokines which cause death from multi-organ failure. We believe that reducing injury from zones one or two reduce mortality, but there is still a mortality coming from the uh, chronically collapsed zone. And this work goes back for a long time ago, first recognised by Gattinoni, where he looked at where lung cysts occurred in these uh, supine patients. And they occurred most in people who had ARDS longer, but they didn't occur, and these were the predecessors of pneumothorax, they didn't occur in the least dependent over distended zones. They, in fact, occurred in the chronically collapsed zones. And he proposed that this was due to stagnation of fluid, infection, and microabscess formation, and um, this was the zone that was producing injurious cytokines. Whereas when you uh, open this lung up, as you do if you turn somebody prone, you don't. That lung zone clears up completely. It's redistributed somewhere else. You get reproduction of surfactant. It's drained. You get a larger tidal volume. But because it's distributed over a larger area, more lung, you in fact get this with less distending pressures. It becomes safer. Now, we've had three, of course, early recruitment and high PEEP trials, one with recruitment in some, one with recruitment in all, one with no recruitment at all. They all had small trends towards reduced mortality, but none of them were significant. And they're all using, if they use recruitment, this 40-40 manoeuvre. Not high enough, not long enough. And that, of course, stimulated us and two other groups that was the uh, art group, primarily in uh, Brazil, and uh, the OLA group in uh, USA, and the Farlap group, which, of course, uh, the dead racehorse, but um, uh, that's for um, alveolar recruitment and uh, low airway pressures and permissive hypercapnia. And we, of course, uh, and they're all similar, these manoeuvres. We stepped up in three steps to, incur, to ensure circulatory safety, and then down in uh, smaller steps to try and find where PEEP was best. And we showed in early studies that some patients, a third of patients desaturated when this happened and two thirds got better, but it didn't matter whether you desaturated or not, you still had improvement. And we showed that um, if, you, uh, if you eliminated people because of desaturation, about 40% of people would have been eliminated uh, because they desaturated. Uh, would have been excluded from the manoeuvre, and another 15% uh, um, didn't get their maximum response until, if they were responders, until they got up to the highest level of PEEP. So we believed we had a 90% response rate to this manoeuvre in uh, patients with early ARDS, and uh, we estimated that if we'd had done a 40-40 manoeuvre, only a 45% response. So that's why we designed this more uh, higher PEEP uh, recruitment manoeuvre. And we showed that it improved um, oxygenation, 
an improved compliance and it reduced length of stay in this very small study, again, not significant. And that's what stimulated the larger trial, the FARLAP trial being done at the moment, which is underway, as uh, was Ola and ART started about the same time and they've both been completed. Now, around this time, there was such enthusiasm for this manoeuvre and such a belief in it that um, this was used as a preventer for um, ECMO. And, um, this was, and this is just one patient, but a recruitment manoeuvre and significant improvement in oxygenation and no longer needed ECMO. And when we did a survey at this time of um, 70 um, ECMO referrals to our hospital, that's a saturation less than 90% on 100% oxygen, despite high level PEEP and other rescues. We found that about 32% of these were rescued by this recruitment manoeuvre. In other words, they didn't, their oxygenation improved enough, they didn't need to go into ECMO. And this was so well believed by um, many units around uh, Australia to be a good thing that a couple of uh, hospitals didn't want to participate in the FARLAP study because they were believed they were doing their patients a disservice by not allowing them to have this manoeuvre in the control group. So then, of course, OLA came on that was finished, and that also was not significant. Again, they, they didn't recruit enough patients. Uh, they had the similar PEEP increases, similar plateau airway pressure increases, and a mortality, uh, again, trending towards reduction, but not significant. And of course, then the real meta-analysis was done on the first three of those patients, showing that if you had moderate or more a ARDS, um, not mild, that you did get a significant improvement, and then, a meta-analysis done by Hodson et al, which showed um, that there was now significant survival data um, to show recruitment improved survival. And of course, we've had speakers tell us that this has now got only about a 17% chance of being correct. Anyway, so then of course, ART came out just two weeks before we'd all finished our talks. And there it was. So Danny, who was sitting there, safely in Ireland, thought, ha, oh, what the hell, I won't have anything to debate anymore. Here's that, game over. It's all shown that uh, alveolar recruitment uh, is dangerous and uh, it increases mortality. So we can pack our bags and uh, you might as well vote now. But I think, um, and this of course is the ART trial, a thousand patients uh, to, a lung, to a recruitment manoeuvre in the uh, treatment group, very similar to the one I showed you. Uh, and um, versus a lower PEEP group. And so, um, but this is contrary to all the prior study trends and meta-analyses, and we know that, uh, these, that non significant trials and meta-analyses don't mean, don't negate the findings of a major, you know, well done randomised trial. So we, that's not evidence. But um, it does make us look at this trial pretty carefully to see why it is so different to all the data so far. Now, the baseline matching in this group was exceptionally good. The recruitment manoeuvre was very similar, although it was to the FARLAP and the OLA recruitment manoeuvres, which are shown there with the uh, plateau and PEEP levels, but they did downgrade it by 10 centimetres water halfway through because of side effects they were having. So, and their exclusion criteria weren't quite as rigorous as ours, but they were fairly similar. So why was this trial showing such different results, and should that result in Danny winning this discussion? Was it the recruitment manoeuvre or was it the ventilation pattern afterwards is the first question. And secondly, were the population groups the same as the ones we treat? So let's look at the, critic, the recruitment manoeuvre. They had three arrests and 16% interruptions due to hypotension and saturation mainly. They paralysed all their patients, possibly implying higher sedation levels and therefore less circulatory adaptation during PEEP application, in other words, more likely to get hypotensive. So that was what caused them to downgrade it and, and probably added to the mortality of the uh, treatment group. But if we look at all the other trials done, there's been no arrests with, with recruitment manoeuvres in alveoli and loves and in OLA to the same level, nor in the FARLAP uh, trials, nor in the FARLAP study. We always get transient blood pressure rise. About a third get a, a transient desaturation. So it, we're not seeing this dangerous effect from recruitment manoeuvres in the other studies. In fact, recruitment manoeuvres um, 
have been shown to be safe and effective at improving saturation and compliance. Now, of course, art has been added to this trial. So we need to look at what ventilatory patterns have been used. You can see that all these trials have showed a PEEP increase. That's what they're about. OLA, a slightly higher PEEP increase than the preceding three, and ART, a little bit higher again. They've all showed a slight increase of plateau pressure, which we have believed until now um, is potentially detrimental. And they've all shown, now that we've got an interest in driving pressures, reductions in driving pressures. But again, as I've said before, all these other trials have shown non-significant reductions in mortality, whereas this has shown a, quite a, uh, shown a significant increase in mortality. Now, recently, Amato has analysed, done a large individual patient meta-analysis, and he's shown that um, when the plateau pressure increases on the left-hand graph at a constant peep, the mortality goes up, plateau and driving pressure going up. But if you keep the driving pressure constant and the peep and plateau go up, there is no change in mortality. Furthermore, if you keep the plateau pressure constant and increase the peep with reduced driving pressure, then the mortality comes down. So he believes the most important factor is in fact driving pressure, not peep or plateau. So let's look at these trials in terms of the changes that were brought about. So if you look at the change in peep from control to treatment, you'll see it goes up in all the trials by varying amounts. The plateau pressure also goes up by the same amounts and the driving pressure reduced a bit. But again, the mortality trend is opposite. If you look at all these things, there's a thousand patients in the ART trial showing a mortality increase. There's two and a half thousand patients who uh, have got very similar changes showing the opposite. Finally, let's look at the mortality. PF ratios, similar, a little bit lower in the last two trials. Percentage of pneumonia, similar in previous trials, maybe a little bit higher in the ART trial. But the mortalities in all the previous trials, in the control group, less than 40%, in the ART trial, strikingly higher. Now, is this applicable um, to our patient groups? Should we abandon recruitment manoeuvres based on, this, um, on these findings? Um, I'm not sure this does apply to the lower mortality uh, healthcare systems that we have, um, and it's always uncomfortable to say that, but that's the difference. Should it be applied to, pay, to areas with a low track record for complications from recruitment manoeuvres and where the mortality trends have been in the opposite direction? I don't believe that we should be abandoning recruitment manoeuvres at all. I think we need to look more carefully at the ventilatory strategy that is used after them. Obviously, we look out for complications. We, sorry, we make sure our, we don't do recruitment manoeuvres when it's unsafe. And I believe that an open aerated draining lung is healthier for that open lung and also healthier for the rest of the lung, which is not as overstretched. Recruitment is safe if you use good exclusion criteria and recruitment does not compromise safe ventilation afterwards. Thank you. We are running a little bit late, so we'll move on to the next speaker who is arguing for the closed lung case, and it's Professor Danny McCauley from uh, a consultant and professor of intensive care medicine at the Regional Intensive Care Unit, Royal Victoria and Queen University in Belfast. He's a co-director of research of the UK Intensive Care Society. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. Um, thank you very much for the uh, invite to uh, speak. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the uh, AP ELSO meeting and, and John Fraser's group for the support attending and very briefly just mention a couple of disclosures before I uh, start in uh, proper. So um, we've heard two brilliant debates uh, which have sort of influenced what I'm going to say. I'm going to be evidence-based, which is a pity that that debate lost, but I'm not going to be that entertaining because I'm not <laughs> that funny, uh, so I'm glad Bala won, but I'm going to try. I'm just going to say... Um, a wee bit about uh, recruitment manoeuvres, and then I'm going to really focus on why uh, um, lung protection ventilation is the key. You heard Professor Tuxon say, Farlap is named after a dead racehorse. It says it all. <laughs> okay, so um, what's the evidence for uh, low tidal volume ventilation? I'm going to try and con convince you of three things, that that is the standard of care. I'm going to try and convince it, in fact, 
we may need to even go more protective. And I'm going to talk a wee bit about why and how CO2 removal might actually enable us to do that as we move to the future. So um, a couple of fundamentals about protecting the lung. And again, it's this idea that whenever we're setting the ventilator, we, we set, oh, what weight's that patient? And we, we dial in. It's important not to forget that um, the size of the lungs doesn't change with your um, uh, level of uh, skinniness or, or obesity. It's determined by your gender and your height. So make sure you're setting the ventilator with, with that in mind. But it's even worse, the other fundamental um, concept to, to not forget whenever you're trying to set the ventilator is the idea that whenever you're setting your tidal volume at 6 mils per kilogram, that assumes a normal lung. But in fact, we know that the majority of the lung won't actually be partaking in ventilation, and that 6 mils per kilogram might actually translate into massively higher tidal volumes in the range of, of 30 to 50 mils whenever you consider open lung units. So ventilation-induced lung injury is absolutely true. And this goes back to the, the 70s. And this is the elegant work from Webb and Tierney that shows if you deliver high pressures and high volumes, you cause increasing injury in animal models. What about in humans? Because we don't look after uh, mice in, in most ICUs. Um, and again, this is a really elegant study from Marco Ranieri where they randomized 37 patients to receive either a uh, conventional protective uh, strategy based on a pressure volume curve or um, a strategy uh, of non-protective ventilation where they tried to optimize uh, oxygenation and, and CO2. And what they found very convincingly within 36 hours of randomizing people to these two injurious uh, ventilation strategies that injurious ventilation drove pulmonary and systemic inflammation. So this was the first mechanistic data in humans to say ventilation really is harmful. And then ARMA was published in 2000, and this really is the, the landmark study in terms of ventilation. And we've heard it's probably not true from John, and that is a problem uh, with my debate, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, and we'll look at what the study did. Um, and this study randomized people to 6 mils per kilogram with a, a target platter pressure less than 30 or uh, 12 mils per kilogram with a, a target uh, platter pressure that was um, allowed to be above 30. And you can see here um, the, the, the two groups um, showed separation in the plateau pressures. And there was a 9% absolute reduction in mortality in the patients who got protective lung ventilation. But it's even better than that. So if you ventilate somebody badly and you stretch their lung, whether it be with PEEP or whether it be with recruitment maneuvers, you cause more harm in non-pulmonary organs. So you can see here across the board, if you ventilate the lung badly, you cause harm in liver, renal, cardiovascular function. And that asks the question, well, why does that happen? And again, this is another elegant study from uh, Art Slutsky where they basically looked at an acid model of injury, ventilated either injuriously or non-injuriously. And just for the sake of time, if you focus on the, the, the kidney data, if you ventilate uh, an animal uh, badly, you cause more cell death within the kidney. If you then take the plasma from that animal and add it ex vivo to renal epithelium, you cause harm. So there's something, there's a soluble mediator driven by injurious ventilation that causes organ failure. So you're not just killing people by damaging their lungs, you're killing people by all the other multiple organ failure that we see uh, in these critically ill patients who are uh, injuriously ventilated. It's even better than that. So if you ventilate somebody badly within their ICU stay, it translates to long-term mortality. So this is work from uh, Dale Needham's group from approximately 485 patients. And they basically showed that if you've got 50% compliance with lung protective ventilation, you've got a 4% absolute risk reduction in mortality. If you have 100%, you've got an 8% uh, reduction at two years. So ventilating people badly early, Recruitment maneuvers, high PEEP, translates into harm. What about if you don't have ARDS? And this is nice work from Marcus Schultz. And essentially in a meta-analysis of uh, studies looking at patients who did not have ARDS, you can see across the board, if you ventilate people more gently, they don't get ARDS. And there's a, 
a signal overall for uh, benefit in terms of a reduction in mortality. So if you don't have ARDS and you ventilate somebody badly, you're going to kill them. And then finally, what about patients in the operating theatre? This is a, a study of 400 patients uh, who were expected to have a high risk of pulmonary complications more than two hours in the operating theatre being ventilated. Patients were randomised to a, a, a conventional uh, six to eight, or sorry, a protective six to eight uh, mils per kilogram with a PEEP of six to eight or an injurious um, 10 to 12 mils per kilogram with uh, no PEEP. And you can see here there was an overall reduction in the uh, number of pulmonary and non-pulmonary complications in the people who were ventilated protectively. PEEP didn't make the difference. So then the question is, how low is, is low enough? And again, this is really elegant data from uh, James Frank and Michael Mathai's lab. And he showed that if you increasingly protect uh, an animal model of ARDS induced by acid, you see progressive reduction in the amount of pulmonary edema and alveolar clearance here used as a measure of the damage to the alveolar epithelium, you see you're maximally protected whenever you go to, to 3 mils per kilogram. Again, that's animal data. What about human data? This is a secondary analysis, so it comes with all the health warnings of a secondary analysis, but a secondary analysis of the ARDS net studies, which showed there's no safe limit. There's not a point here where um, reducing the plateau pressure seems to reduce mortality. So protective ventilation clearly um, is, is important, and we may need to go below 6 mils, the traditional concept. And again, um, in terms of additional uh, human data, this is lovely work from, uh, again, Marco Ranieri. And you can see here that this was, uh, basically the red areas show um, hyperinflation. So even people who are managed with 6 mils per kilogram, there's still evidence of additional hyperinflation in approximately 30% of people. And in another study, they were able to show that using CO2 removal to further reduce uh, tidal volume down to 4 mils per kilogram, they were able to uh, further uh, reduce pulmonary inflammation, suggesting the potential that that might translate into clinical benefit, although that remains unproven. So um, what is the uh, data to support uh, CO2 removal to further facilitate a reduction in tidal volume? And this is a, a systematic review that we undertook of uh, CO2 removal studies. And what we found was, as John has already uh, nicely alluded to, we needed more research. And this was a preamble to trying to get a trial funded. And if you're going to try and get a trial funded, the conclusion has to be we need more research. But uh, again, this was the conclusion of this uh, uh, meta-analysis that the research that we had was limited, but there was perhaps some signal in a small study in a post hoc analysis that if you were uh, very severely hypoxic, that they might benefit. So is CO2 removal feasible? And this is uh, work that um, um, Alain Coombs has been leading. And this is a, a small pilot study of 15 patients to suggest that CO2 removal um, is beneficial uh, in terms of uh, reducing tidal volume, so it's feasible and safe. And then the larger supernova study that um, Alain is going to present uh, later on in the week looked at uh, patients who um, received uh, CO2 removal in a, in a larger cohort of 97 patients and found again that CO2 removal was uh, uh, able to reduce tidal volume to 4 mils per kilogram uh, and was uh, safe in, in this cohort. So that leads me then to my uh, final slide and really just to say that we're now trying to ask that question is CO2 removal uh, uh, efficient in terms of reducing tidal volume but also improving outcome? So we're undertaking a large clinical trial uh, to um, basically answer the question in patients with moderate to severe acute hypoxic respiratory failure randomized to CO2 removal or standard care with 90-day mortality as the primary outcome. We've recruited 127 patients, so I don't have the answer to date. But certainly, I think it's clear to say that on the basis of current evidence, and I'll conclude there for the, for the sake of time at a few more slides, but I'll, I'll stop because it's uh, for, for several reasons. A, that um, uh, we're, we're a bit overrunning, but B, because I think it's eminently clear that A, the standard of care should be lung protective ventilation, and B, now with the publication of art, that there's no place for recruitment maneuvers. I'll finish there. So now to the voting. Uh, you can tap in and vote uh, for David for open and Danny for closed.
Hopefully we'll see the results and it's moving a bit but it looks like David's made the more convincing case. There's no p-value associated with it so we know that it's probably accurate this data. So we think that uh, David is the winner of this debate.